morning, attempting to watch 24 Disney direct-to-DVD sequels within the span of five days in order to create a video ranking each and every one of them may cause you to combust. <laughs> Hello everybody, Nikki Mara here, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I hope you all have had a fabulous week and are ready for a interesting ranking video. Now for those of you who have experienced a video from me before, we are no strangers on this channel to ranking Disney movies and characters. It is no secret that the Disney canon is incredibly beloved by the general public. Disney's created some of the most incredible stories and wonderful characters that we all know and love from childhood and bring with us into Disney adulthood. <laughs> and while thus far I have had a very easy and fun time ranking some of my favorite movies and characters on this channel, Today's video is a little different. <laughs> As some of you may know, from the year 1994 to 2008, Disney became very well known for putting out direct-to-DVD sequels to some of their most wonderful Disney animated movies. These direct-to-DVD sequels were often lower budget, meaning less money was spent in creating them, and production was moved along very quickly so that way these movies could be put out to the public, and also seeing that they were DVD sequels, they were made very easy to attain by the public. And Believe me when I say there are a few hidden gems amongst these DVD releases, you really have to sift through all of the other ones in order to find them. <laughs> and so for this week's video, I sat and watched 24 of Disney's animated DVD release sequels, and today I'm going to be ranking them from worst to best, because someone's gotta do it. So if you are excited for today's video, make sure to like and subscribe down below so that way you never miss magic from me. And if you'd like to find me on any of my other social medias for even more magical content, my handle is at Nikki Mara, and you can find me on Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, and YouTube. But we're not gonna spend too much time on the intro today because we have a lot to talk about with all of these sequels. So as always, I'm gonna jump into some disclaimers and conditions for the list today. And in all honesty, I would recommend watching the conditions for today because we did have to cut some animated movies. And I'd like you to know which ones are actually gonna be on the list today. But in the event you do want to skip the disclaimers and conditions, then you can head right to this timestamp for the start of the ranking. As for our disclaimers, first and foremost, I am not associated with the Walt Disney Company. I do not speak for the brand or the company. All of the opinions in this video are just my own and they do not reflect those of the company. And secondly, I welcome any and all opinions about these movies and characters down in my comment section. So feel free to leave your thoughts down below. I am very curious to see what you have to say about all of these Disney sequels and how your favorites compare to mine. And as one more brief disclaimer, there are spoilers ahead for every single Disney animated direct-to-DVD sequel. <laughs> so if you don't want anything spoiled for a specific sequel, I definitely recommend skipping on to the next one. And as for the conditions today, this list is going to consist of direct-to-DVD animated sequels from the Walt Disney Company from the years 1994 to 2008. These movies cannot have been released in theaters. None of them include any live action sequences. And here's the big one, and I apologize in advance. The Winnie the Pooh sequels and the Tinkerbell movies are not going to be included in today's list. I am more than happy to do an entire video of just those two movies because there are a lot of them and they are very detailed. But today I wanted to stick to movies that were just one and two sequels that had to do with the movies. Now keep in mind that today's list is also only included including sequels and not spin-off movies. There are animated movies such as Stitch the Movie that is also technically could be on this list. However, because it's not necessarily tied into the plot of the original movie, it's not going to be included on today's list. Oh, and keep in mind that the movies on today's list can either be prequels, meaning they take place before the events of the original movie, midquels, meaning they take place during the middle of the original animated movie, or sequels, meaning they take place after the events of the original animated movie. And I believe that takes care of all of our disclaimers and conditions today, and so I believe we're ready to jump into today's ranking. Oh, and really quick, I did want to go over a quick list of talking points that I'm going to touch on for each of these movies. The talking points that we're going to be going over today are the animation quality quality, the storyline of the movie, the music included within the movie, and whether or not it is worth the watch. Do I think it's worth investing your time in sitting down and experiencing the story, and does it necessarily add to the original animated movie? And as always with my movie rankings, we are going to be ranking them on a tier scale, so I will make sure to tell you what each of the tiers mean as we move along through them. So with all of that, I believe we're ready to jump into today's rankings, so sit back, relax, grab yourself a snack and a drink, and let's rank Disney's direct-to-DVD animated sequels. Today we are starting all the way down in the F tier. These are movies that I 
do not enjoy. In re-watching them, I actually found myself having a very negative experience. And in all honesty, I think watching these movies can negatively affect your experience of the original animated movie. Again, F tier, I did not like, had a hard time sitting through, and would just generally not recommend. Alrighty, we are starting today's list all the way down at the bottom at number 24, which is Beauty and the Beast, Belle's Magical World. First and foremost, the animation in this movie. It's rough. The character animations are very choppy as you're watching, and the characters also tend to look a little bit different from scene to scene. They're not really a consistent design. As for the plot, the enchanted objects in the castle are sitting down and recounting three specific stories that have happened during the events of Beauty and the Beast. The first of which involves Belle and Beast getting into a fight and needing to come together to apologize. However, neither one of them wants to do that. The second is that Fifi, the feather duster, believes that Lumiere is cheating on her with Bell. How that would work, I have no idea. <laughs> and the final segment is that a bird has gotten hurt and Belle brings it into the castle in order to heal it. And the beast turns out to not be a fan of birds and goes after the bird, but eventually after he hears the bird sing, he holds it captive and then eventually has a heart and lets him go. Now, being very honest, I do not think that any of these segments add to the original animated story. In fact, certain ones, such as the bird segment and also the apology segment, add a lot of drama to the original animated movie that is just not necessary. The original animated movie is so thoroughly put together and has perfect pacing, and adding so many resolutions and climaxes just makes it seem so unnecessary. There is also music in this movie, which, and I'm gonna be honest, I am not a fan of the music in this movie. It did not add anything to the movie. In fact, I remember thinking when the song started, oh god, they're gonna sing in this movie. And is it worth the watch? No. No. Save your time. This one is not worth it. Let's move on to the next one. <laughs> next, we're moving on up to number 23 on my list which is Tarzan and Jane. Now, much like Belle's Magical World, the animation in this movie is rough. The characters are overly simplified in character design, and the animation is also kind of rough and choppy. As for the story, Tarzan and Jane are celebrating their one-year anniversary together, and Jane, along with Tantor, Turk, and her father, recount different stories that have happened to Tarzan and Jane within the last year in order to help her decide what she's going to do for their one-year anniversary. These stories include Jane's friends from London coming to visit them, Tarzan wanting to learn more about England's proposals and weddings, and also traveling to a diamond mine to find Jane a diamond. And the final one is that Jane's childhood friend, who's also a secret agent, lands on the island. Tarzan gets jealous of them dancing, and her friend is then brought back to England for consequences. The music in this movie is essentially non-existent. There's only songs at the very, very beginning and the very, very end. They're not in between all of the stories. Overall, I'm just gonna be honest, it's not attention grabbing, and it also doesn't add much as a sequel to the original animated movie. So would I recommend it? No. Let's move on. <laughs> Moving on up to number 22 on my list is Aladdin 2, The Return of Jafar. Now, once again, staying in the theme of the F tier, the animation is not spectacular. The character designs are overly simplified and there is a lot of choppy movement, but the one thing I'll say about this is the storyline is actually pretty good. Iago escapes from Jafar in his lamp, where we left him at the end of the original animated movie, and travels back to Agrabah, and slowly but surely earns the trust of Aladdin and his friends. And so Iago's character is very heavily developed in this movie, however we do get a lot of Gilbert Godfrey's voice in this movie. While he had very limited lines in the original Aladdin, and so Iago's voice didn't necessarily appear every other second of the movie, Iago essentially has every other line, and so we're getting songs and storyline from the voice of Gilbert Godfrey. And while it is a fabulous character voice, and I think it is essential to Iago, it's an hour and 15 minutes of him being the central character. The songs in this movie are not great, and I also will say the lack of Robin Williams as the genie in this movie is detrimental to it. I will say this movie does have a lot of Disney references, which are actually really fun and cute to spot. Abby's Maul is not the best villain sidekick. Jafar doesn't really feel as threatening as he does in the original. Although I do have to say, I really do enjoy the singing voice of Jasmine. In the Aladdin sequels, the singing voice of Princess Jasmine was not done by Leia Salonga, but rather Liz Calloy, who actually you might also know as the singing voice of Anastasia from the popular 20th Century Fox movie. So while Liz Calloy does sound quite 
quite lovely as Princess Jasmine. The songs are not my favorite, as in musically written. And so overall, would I recommend this movie? Not necessarily, but if I had to pick one that we've talked about so far, it would be this one. And with that, we're gonna move on up to number 21 on my list, the final movie within the F tier, which is The Hunchback of Notre Dame 2. Starting off once again with the animation, it is still rough. <laughs> especially when you compare it to the absolute artistry that is the original animated Hunchback. This movie is beautiful, it has the lighting, it has the character design, it has absolutely everything. And Hunchback 2, in terms of visuals, really does feel like the bare minimum. Characters are overly simplified, the animation is not necessarily fluid, and the characters that we know and love from the original don't necessarily get the most screen time. That's more so reserved for the new characters who don't necessarily come across as deep and emotional. As for the plot, this movie takes place during the Festival L'Amour, which is a festival of love, and this of course brings up the notion of Quasimodo's lack of love interest. There's also a traveling circus coming through, which introduces us to the characters of Sarouche and Madeline, Sarouche being our villain and Madeline being the eventual love interest for Quasimodo. Sarouche as the villain, his goal is to take La Fidèle, which is a decked out and beautifully jewel encrusted bell from Notre Dame. And while this could possibly happen if he had magical powers, he very much seems to just be a regular con artist that uses trickery in order to put on a good magic show for a crowd. And so him trying to steal a massive bell from within Notre Dame is really not the most realistic plotline. In addition, the storyline of Quasimodo really wanting a love interest sort of negates his need for one in the original. I will say the voice cast is quite good, as it is significantly comprised of the original voice actors from Punchback 1. However, I'm going to be very honest, the script does lack a lot of depth. To the point where Sarouche, the villain in this story, questions whether or not they make diamond underwear. I... 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 Yeah. <laughs> so would I recommend this movie overall? No. Once again, I do not feel that you need to watch this movie in order to have a better experience watching the first Hunchback of Notre Dame. But with that, we are moving on up to the D tier. Thank God. <laughs> now the D tier is comprised of movies that I didn't necessarily have a difficult time watching, but they definitely didn't grab my attention. Overall, I still don't think you need to watch these movies to appreciate the original. However, these movies are definitely not bottom of the barrel. They look a lot better, they sound a lot better, but still I wouldn't necessarily recommend. Starting off the D tier at number 20 on my list is The Fox and the Hound 2. Now, the animation in this movie is quite a big jump. This movie came out in 2006, so there was significantly more CG animated animation included in this movie. However, CG animation was still early enough to the point where it does look a little bit strange in this movie sometimes. You can definitely pick out elements that are, oh, that's specifically 2D and that's specifically 3D animation. Just not super cohesive, but still it's better than the choppy 2D animation that we've had so far. As for the plot of this movie, it is a midquel to the original Fox and the Hound movie. It takes place when both Todd and Copper are children, and there is a traveling fair coming through their town. There is a canine country group within the fair, and Copper ends up going and realizing that he is a good singer. Eventually he has the choice to end up traveling with them or staying behind with Todd, and of course he chooses to stay behind with Todd, and we know this because the rest of the events of The Fox and the Hound involve both of them being there. So while the plot is relatively sweet and fun to watch, it doesn't necessarily carry the same energy of the original animated movie. Now in case you aren't aware, the original animated movie is very depressing and sad, and so to have this entire movie that is very joyful and surrounded in music, it's a little bit strange and it feels like its own entire character from the original. And speaking of the music, this movie is a country musical. Pretty much all of the songs in this movie are country songs. They have a very country sound and they're sung by country singers. And in all honesty, that is the reason why it ranks at number 20 on my list is because I'm just not a really big country fan. I found myself really zoning out during a lot of the songs and I wish that weren't the case, but I'm just not a big country fan. So yeah, do I recommend this movie? Not. Personally, if you like country music, I would say it might be a good watch for you. And if you want a little bit more happiness surrounding The Fox and the Hound, then 
sure, but in all honesty, I personally wouldn't add it. I think Fox and the Hound on its own is a significantly more complex and enjoyable animated movie on its own. But with that, we move on up to number 19 on my list, which is Kronk's New Groove. Now the animation of Kronk's New Groove is a big jump up. It looks really, really good. Kronk's New Groove tells the story of Kronk after the events of the Emperor's New Groove. He is now the head chef and delivery man of the restaurant he works in, and his dad sends him a letter that says he's going to come and visit him and hopes to see his wife, kids, and house. And this leaves Kronk in a little bit of a dilemma because he has none of the above. <laughs> and so we get to see three separate stories that tell about Kronk and how he attempted to get each of these things. The first of which involves Yzma, in which he tries to get his own house by selling a potion that she says will keep everybody young, but that he knows to be fraudulent. And the other two of which involve his squirrel scout gang. In the end, his father comes to visit him and the town helps him to create this facade of having a wife, children, and a house. But eventually Kronk comes comes clean and his father loves him just the way he is. I think the music in this movie is kind of cute, but I really think where it stands out is the comedy. It is quite silly of a movie. And so overall, would I recommend this movie? Not personally. Again, it wasn't my cup of tea, but I will say if you do like the comedy of the original Emperor's New Groove, then you might very well enjoy this one. Emperor's New Groove isn't necessarily my favorite animated movie, but again, if you really enjoy it, it could very well add to your experience of the original. Next, we're moving on up to number 18 on my list, which is The Lady and the Tramp 2, Scamp's Adventure. As for the animation, this movie also looks pretty good, I'm gonna be honest. This movie tells the story of Scamp, the child of Lady and the Tramp, and how he's a troublemaker at home and really feels confined having to follow all the rules. After one particular messy accident within the house, he ends up chained outside to the doghouse, and he ends up escaping into a group of junkyard dogs. He tries to fit in with them, but eventually realizes that what he needs is love in his home. And so he travels back home with his new friend Angel and rejoins his family. In all honesty, the plot is not bad. That's not necessarily what keeps this movie in the D tier, but let's get into what does. The music in this movie is not necessarily my favorite. There are some songs that are actually quite good, but I believe it's because of the singers. The opening number is actually very cute and very fun to watch, however it immediately establishes that this movie's energy is completely different from the original Lady and the Tramp. And to the fellow Little Mermaid fans out there, Jodie Benson, the voice of Ariel, is actually the voice of Lady in this movie. And so we get some very pretty vocals from Lady. What I think is very strange about this movie is that there is a vastly added presence of Jim Deere and Darling. Now in the original Lady and the Tramp, they were sort of shown from the waist down in order to keep the perspective of the movie of the dogs. However, in this movie, it's really a perspective of everybody, so there are just as much characters as the dogs. I'll also be completely honest, I feel like the voice cast of this movie, specifically with the puppy characters, all sound a little bit too old to be playing the roles that they are. We see from watching the movie that Scamp is a puppy, however, he very much sounds like an older teenager. However, the one good thing I will say about this movie is that there are a couple duets that are sung by Roger Bart and Susan Egan, who, in case you weren't aware, are the singing voices of Hercules and Meg. So while the songs in this movie are technically sung by the characters of Scamp and Angel, they can also very well sound like a Hercules and Meg duet, which we never got in the original, so kind of fun. And would I recommend this movie to you? I guess more than anything else that we've talked about so far. <laughs> I don't necessarily think it adds to the exact energy of the original animated movie, but it could be a very good movie for a lot of younger audiences. It's cute, it's definitely not necessary. With that, we'll move on up to number 17 on my list, which is Cinderella 2, Dreams Come True. Now, like a lot of the other movies we talked about so far, this movie includes segments from Cinderella's life after marrying the prince. The animation in this movie is very fluid, like it doesn't look choppy at all, but it's not detailed. The characters are very simplified and the backgrounds are very simplified. As I said earlier, this movie contains segments of stories, the first of which is Cinderella setting up a royal banquet, the second of which is Jacques wanting to become a human, and the third of which is Anastasia falling in love with the town baker. As for the music in this movie, it is all done in voiceover. The characters themselves don't sing any of the music, and we really just get a few songs to a montage sequence. And do I recommend this movie? It's 
Again, okay, I wouldn't necessarily say yes, you should definitely watch this movie. If you are a Cinderella fan, then I don't think watching this movie would necessarily inhibit the experience of the original animated movie. But for a personal opinion, I will say the first two stories in this movie are not my favorite and don't feel necessary, but I do think the third one with Anastasia falling in love with the baker is actually quite cute. So yeah, that's Cinderella 2. And next we're moving on up to number 16 on my list, which is the final movie within the D tier which is Pocahontas 2. Starting off with the animation, the animation in this movie is not strong. Once again, it feels a little choppy and the characters aren't necessarily as detailed as they are in the original. And once again, much like the original animated movie, the storyline can be viewed as historically inaccurate. And because of that, a little problematic. The new characters added into this movie aren't necessarily memorable. And the biggest problem that I have with this movie, which keeps it in the D tier, is that the original animated movie set up a love story between Pocahontas and John Smith, which was not historically accurate in any way, shape, or form. And while all of it is based in inaccuracy, I have to say they did do a very beautiful job artistically with it. This movie, Pocahontas 2, attempts to correct that misplaced love story, redirecting Pocahontas from John Smith to John Rolfe, who was her actual husband in real life. However, it's done with a lot less love and care in this movie, specifically because Pocahontas and John Smith in the original seemed like a really good fit for each other character-wise. However, in this movie, they set up this love triangle with John Rolfe in there, and then upon meeting John Smith again, Pocahontas looks at him and says, we walked the same path once, but my heart lies somewhere else now. And so it kind of feels like they took that historically inaccurate, beautiful romance in the first one and like tossed it away for one that's not nearly as interesting, but historically accurate. So this one is like a toss up for me. It's not great overall, but like it entertained me. I'm not going to lie. But the main reason why it ranks the highest on my list so far is the music. Now a lot of this music is not necessarily my favorite, however I stand very firm that this movie includes the best song out of any Disney animated movie on today's list. The song Where Do I Go From Here, sung by Pocahontas, who also shares the exact same singing voice actress she does in the original, who is Judy Kuhn, performs the song Where Do I Go From Here and it is Absolutely stunning. It's my favorite song in any of these movies by far. And so while again, I have problems with the movie, I love the song to the point where I believe the song could easily fit in a theatrical released animated movie. It's a beautiful song. Highly recommend just listening to it once. But besides that, you don't really need to watch this movie. I don't necessarily recommend it. And with that, we've reached the C tier. The C tier consists of movies that are okay. Would I recommend them? Not necessarily, but would I recommend not watching them? Not necessarily. I would say if you're a fan of the original animated movie, you can watch them. Not necessarily saying you'll have a great experience with them, but I don't necessarily think they will ruin your experience of the original. The three movies in the C tier are kind of just whatever. <laughs> so with that, we'll start on off at number 15 on my list, which is 101 Dalmatians 2 Patches London Adventure. Now I will say, I think this movie is very well animated, to the point where it actually keeps the same stylism as the original. As for the storyline, it is pretty cute in all honesty. Patch, the son of Pongo and Perdita, is a big fan of the superhero canine Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt is traveling through the town and Patch wants to meet him. And when Roger and Anita are deciding to move away, Patch is left behind. He ends up meeting Thunderbolt, his childhood hero, and teams up with him in order to save all of his brothers and sisters once again from Cruella. As for the music, the underscoring and the brief new songs that appear in this movie are overall pretty good. And would I recommend it? Sure. I don't necessarily think it's a necessity in order to appreciate the original animated movie more, but I don't think this is a bad sequel by any means. It's, it's, it's okay. It's pretty good. Next, we're moving on up to number 14 on my list, which is Beauty and the Beast, The Enchanted Christmas. Now, this movie is a midquill to the original animated movie. It takes place right after Belle is saved by the beast from the wolves. The animation in this movie is not bad, although there are some elements of 3D animation in there that do look a little off in comparison to the 2D animation. As for the story, Tim Curry's Maestro Forte is probably one of the best villains on this list today. However, what keeps this movie very middle of the road is that Belle is constantly trying to appease the beast and try to keep him happy. She is trying to put together a Christmas for all of the enchanted objects and the beast, and the beast wants nothing to do with it. However, she genuinely believes that celebrating a Christmas will 
make him happier. It's just very strange watching Belle sort of bend to try to keep the Beast happy, where she doesn't do that at all in the animated movie. She seems a lot stronger. It's also important to mention that Lumiere now has a different love interest than he does in any of the other animated movies, who is Angelique, who is a treetopper angel. Keep in mind, for the music of this movie, it is all Christmas themed, and so it wasn't necessarily my favorite because I felt like I was watching it in the completely wrong season. <laughs> it isn't necessarily the most memorable music, but it also isn't badly written, but I will say it is quite cool that we get to see the night that the Enchantress put the curse on the beast. That's probably my favorite section of this movie, but I also do very much enjoy the villain, Maestro Forte. I think he's a great addition to the movie. And we do get some very funny puns in here too, which I am absolutely a fan of. So would I recommend it overall? To very strong Beauty and the Beast fans, you might not like it, but if you're not the biggest fan of the original, I don't think it's a bad watch. And with that, we're moving on up to the final member of the C tier. So at number 13 is Tarzan 2. Now Tarzan 2 has some really good animation and some very strong background work. The animation that is set behind the characters is very visually beautiful. Tarzan 2 is a midquel in the original animated movie. It takes place when Tarzan is a child, and it tells the story of Tarzan growing up and getting acclimated to living in the jungle. And after a very scary event where Tarzan is thought to have died, and Kala gets injured trying to save him, Tarzan overhears other gorillas in their pack saying that Kala is better off without him, and so he runs off on his own. At the beginning, he starts off the movie very afraid of this mysterious monster called Zugor, however very quickly realizes that he is just an old ape, and this old ape sort of helps Tarzan become an ape and fit in with them. The music in this movie contains both new music by Phil Collins, but also repeated music from the original animated movie. And overall, would I recommend it? It's, again, it's okay. It's not necessary in order to love the original animated movie, but if you are a big Tarzan fan and love the original animated and you want to see even more of young Tarzan, this might be a good watch for you. But with that, we have reached the B tier on today's list. The B tier consists of movies that I think aren't bad. They're pretty good. This doesn't necessarily mean that I recommend watching them, much like the C tier, or that they add to the experience of the original, but I do think overall the movies are a lot more cohesive, and it's harder to pick out negative things such as the animation, the music, or the storyline. So with that, we'll move on up to number 12 on my list, which is The Little Mermaid 2 Return to the Sea. As for the animation, it is very good in this movie. The storyline of this movie has to do with Ariel's daughter, Melody. Melody is a human and is kept out of the water as she is in danger of Morgana, the villain of this movie, who is Ursula's sister. Melody has this strong pull in her heart that she belongs in the sea. And so eventually she runs away from home, meets Morgana, who transforms her into a mermaid, and Morgana convinces her to steal the trident away, so that way Morgana can transform her into a mermaid full time. As for the music, I will be completely honest, I don't think a lot of the music in this movie is memorable. However, as always, it is such a pleasure to hear Jodie Benson's voice again. Now, I will be completely honest, I do think the side characters in this movie are uninteresting, and in all honesty, so is Melody. Especially when you compare her to her mother, who is a vastly more complex character, but who is sidelined for her daughter in this movie. I think Morgana, as a villain, is fine, she's not bad, but the reason why I don't rank this movie any higher is because you all know Ariel is my favorite Disney character of all time, and she acts so uncharacteristically to herself in this movie. Essentially, Ariel adapts a lot of characteristics of her father from the original animated movie, lying to Melody for 12 years and getting angry at her when she is just curious about life outside the castle. And I really watched this movie watching Ariel thinking, Ariel wouldn't do that. And so it's not a bad movie overall, it's very cohesive with itself, but I personally, being a very big fan of the original animated movie The Little Mermaid, had some difficulties accepting that Ariel became this way as she got older. And so would I recommend it? To my fellow Little Mermaid fans out there, I might say skip out on this one, but if The Little Mermaid isn't your favorite, then I don't necessarily think that this will be a bad watch for you. Next we move on up to number 11 on my list, which is Aladdin and the King of Thieves. Now the animation in this one is not some of the best on this list, but it's not bad. It's generally acceptable. And thank goodness the third installment of Aladdin brought back Robin Williams as the genie. The storyline is very good in this movie, where Aladdin is reconnected with his father, 
and eventually ends up marrying Princess Jasmine. There's of course a lot of drama in the middle, but all of it is very interesting and very wonderful. And I hesitate to tell you any more details, and I'll tell you why in a second. The music in this movie is considerably better than the other Aladdin sequel, Return of Jafar, and in all honesty I would say this is a nice little bow on top of the Aladdin franchise. And would I recommend it? Yeah, in all honesty, I think this is a very good movie. And I know it's a little strange to recommend number three to you and not number two, but in all honesty, you can totally skip from Aladdin 1 to Aladdin 3 just knowing that Iago is now on the side of the good guys. That's really the only element that you need to know in order to go into Aladdin 3. And so I would just do that. I definitely recommend this movie. It's not bad at all. With that, we move on up to number 10 on my list which is Mulan 2. Starting off with the animation of Mulan 2, the animation is quite good in this movie, except for the moments when Mulan and Li Shang get angry. The expression of anger in this movie is very over the top and very animated and very overdone. The storyline is quite good. Mulan and Li Shang are helping three princesses travel across China as they are set to be married to three princes. However, along the way, these three princesses fall in love with Ling, Yao, and Chan Pe and it makes for a little bit of chaos. The part that I don't love is that Mushu is trying to drive Mulan and Li Shang apart. He's trying to break them up as they have just gotten engaged. And while there are some very deep moments in this movie, such as when Mulan believes that Li Shang has just fallen to his death, in all honesty, the big emotional moments aren't necessarily earned, in my opinion. They seem to come out of nowhere, and there's just not a ton of emotion behind them. The music in this movie is fine, it's enjoyable. Not the most memorable, but we've heard a lot worse so far on this list. And so yeah, would I recommend this movie? Sure. Yeah, I think this is a pretty good sequel to the original Mulan, and even though the characters aren't necessarily the most solid continuation of their original, Overall, the movie is quite enjoyable. And with that, we're moving on up to number nine on my list, the final movie within the B tier, which is an extremely goofy movie. Now, the animation in this movie is very good. I really enjoyed the animation. And I'm gonna be honest, I think this is a very good sequel to the original animated movie. The plot of this movie actually very heavily invokes emotion as Max is moving away to college and Goofy is left on his own. Of course, this doesn't last for long as Goofy gets fired from his job and needs a college degree in order to get another good job. And so he joins Max at college. There's a bunch of hubbub in the middle of a skate competition, which ends up driving the father and son apart. However, of course, they come back together at the end of the movie. It is a very exciting climax to the movie, and although there isn't music in this movie, I did find it quite enjoyable. Although a little strange that the character Roxanne from the original is never mentioned in this movie. Overall, I did very much enjoy it, and would I recommend it? Yeah, in all honesty, I would definitely recommend this movie. It is very cute. But with that, we have reached the A tier on my list today. The A tier consists of movies that are really quite good. These are movies that overall I would say not everybody is going to love, but I very much enjoyed them and think they are very good continuations of the original animated movie. Now, are they the best on this list? No but we'll get into those shortly. <laughs> Starting off the A tier at number eight on my list is Lilo and Stitch 2, Stitch Has a Glitch. Now don't be fooled by the hokey name that this movie has, it is quite good. The animation in this movie is very fluid and very solid, even on par with the original animated movie. And the story is also quite nice. Stitch is very worried about becoming bad as he is starting to glitch and have moments of badness and chaos. There is a May Day hula competition that Lilo is entering, and throughout there is a very heavily deep feeling that Lilo is alienated from every other kid her age because she doesn't have her parents. Overall, Lilo and Stitch retain their personalities from the original and even get to expand on them a little bit. And the comedy in this movie is quite good and quite enjoyable. There isn't a lot of music in this movie, so it's definitely not a point to talk about in terms of whether to watch it or not. But overall, the climax and the musical sequence that ends this movie are very strong and very impactful. And so would I recommend this movie? Yeah, I think it's a very good continuation, and I think it's a safe continuation. I don't think anybody that loves the original animated movie would necessarily hate on this one. But with that, we'll move on up to number seven on my list, which is The Jungle Book 2. Now, the animation in this movie is quite good, and the musical numbers are actually very entertaining. I believe it's a very good continuation of the original story, as it expands on the characters of Mowgli and Shanti, and also introduces us to some new characters like Ranjan. And I have to say, the voice acting in this movie is 
absolutely fantastic. As for the plot, this movie tells the story of Mowgli being in the man village and wanting to go back to visit the jungle. Of course, Shere Khan is still on the loose, and so there is a bunch of danger there, and eventually Shanti and Ranjan go into the jungle to find him, and there is a big ending battle against Shere Khan. And I want to point out that Tony J is the voice of Shere Khan in this movie. Now you might recognize him as the voice of Monsieur Dark or even Judge Claude Frollo, and his voice acting in this movie sent chills up my spine. Oh, it was so good. The final battle sequence is absolutely phenomenal, and this movie has a very deep ending with Mowgli having to decide whether to stay in the man village or to go back to the jungle. Overall, definitely recommend. I really liked this movie, and yeah, I think it's a really good continuation of the original. Up next, we move on up to number six on my list, which is The Lion King 2, Simba's Pride. Now, I very much enjoyed this one. The animation in this movie is quite beautiful. The plotline of Simba's daughter Kiara is actually really awesome as well. Kiara, the princess of the Pride Lands, becomes friends with Kovu, who is Scar's chosen one. Kovu lives with his mother, Zira, who is the main villain of this movie, in the elephant graveyard that Scar used to inhibit. And while Kovu isn't related to Scar, there is absolutely a resemblance between the two. With them being from two separate packs, there is of course a little bit of a Romeo and Juliet type situation between the two lions. And this movie does have some very deep moments with Zira's other son passing away. But overall, I very much enjoyed the plot of this movie and I would say it adds to the original. Now, as for the music, the music in this movie is quite gorgeous. And the opening number, He Lives In You, is actually also included in the Broadway musical. There's also a slight reference to the Endless Night reprise, which happens after Simba's dream. He doesn't sing Endless Night, but it's in the underscoring, and it's kind of cool to hear some Broadway songs in a direct-to-DVD release. Simba, of course, has to act as the overprotective father, just as his father was, so there is a lot of generational traits passed down, but in all honesty, it all makes sense, and it's actually really cool to see. So overall, would I recommend this movie? Yeah, I would definitely recommend this movie. I think it is definitely an enjoyable watch for any Lion King fan. And with that, we've reached number five on my list, the final movie within the A tier, which is Bambi 2. Now, the animation in Bambi 2 is very good. It is quite beautiful. Bambi 2 is a mid-quill to the original animated movie, and the movie begins right after the passing of Bambi's mother. The prince of the forest, who is Bambi's father, ends up taking Bambi in for the winter, and he is a very cold and uncaring person. Or, dear. <laughs> he often gives Bambi life advice, like leave the past in the past, which doesn't help Bambi's situation at all. But again, this is part of Bambi's struggle, so it is important that his father not be the best to him. Overall, Bambi, Feline, Thumper, and Flower all keep their personalities from the original, and there are a few new characters such as Rono who do add to the plot overall. Now, where this movie absolutely wins is the invoking of emotion. In case you are not aware, the original Bambi is quite a heartstring tugger for me. I cannot watch the original movie without crying, and this movie also made me cry. Cue clip. <laughs> yes, there is a dream sequence where Bambi sees his mother once again. My god, it is tough to get through. <laughs> it's also quite sad to see Bambi being surrounded by his friends in a specific sequence where their friend group is disbanding and all of the mothers are calling on the kids to come home and Bambi is left alone by himself. Overall, this plot is an emotional roller coaster. It did make me cry multiple times, but I'll be completely honest, it is quite powerful, quite beautiful, and I also don't know if I'll be able to revisit it for a while, but specifically because it invokes heavy emotion. But overall, I absolutely loved it, and I really do think it added to the original. So if you are able to emotionally handle the original animated movie, I definitely think that this is also a very good addition to the original. And with that, friends, we have reached the S tier. The S tier consists of four movies that I think are absolutely spectacular and are hidden gems of the direct-to-DVD sequels that Disney has released. This S tier consists of movies that I believe not only are great movies on their own, but also add to the experience of the original animated movie. They either give us great storyline that continues the story, some deeper characters with greater personalities, and new comedy. So yes, right off the bat, do I recommend these four movies in the S tier? 
definitely. I would definitely recommend these four. But with that, let's start off the S tier at number four on my list today, which is The Lion King One and a Half. Starting off with the animation, this movie is very well animated. It looks very beautiful. Now, the plot of this movie is actually the plot of the original Lion King. However, it's told from the perspective of Timon and Pumbaa. Timon and Pumbaa take the main character seat in this movie, which makes for an absolute comedy trip. In addition to watching Timon and Pumbaa go through the events of this movie, there are also moments of fourth wall breaking where Timon and Pumbaa make commentary on the original movie. The fourth wall breaks and the added story elements to the original add so much comedy, I genuinely was belly laughing during this movie. And there are also some really great Disney references put into this movie, as well as a lot of Hidden Mickeys. So if you're a fan of Hidden Mickeys, definitely recommend this one because you'll find a lot. And while I do think that the music in this movie is quite fun, it's the comedy for me that really hammers this one home as an S tier movie. And so would I recommend this movie? Only if you love the original Lion King movie and are looking for a very strong belly laugh. Yeah, I loved this movie. I have nothing bad to say about it. And I definitely see myself watching it again in the future. Next moving on up to number three on my list is Brother Bear 2. Now, Brother Bear 2 tells the story of Kenai and Koda, but also introduces a new character named Nita. Nita was a friend of Kenai's when they were younger, and this story picks up where Nita is about to get married. The spirits send down a sign breaking the ground between her and her intended husband, and she then has to go on a quest with Kenai in order to destroy an amulet which will allow her to get married. Along the way, Koda gets jealous of the budding relationship between Kenai and Nita, but eventually they burn the amulet and Nita Nita decides that what she really wants is to be with Kenai. And spoiler alert, at the very end of the movie, she is transformed into a bear and ends up staying with Kenai and Koda. Overall, I think this plot vastly adds onto the original animated movie. I also think the new added character of Nita is very deep. I think she's very much as deep of a character as Kenai and Koda in this movie. The music is okay in this movie. It's definitely not a standout. To me, what really stood out is the character depth and development that took place, and also the storyline. I feel like the story is one of the most well thought out out of any of these movies, and it very much feels like a clear path that this movie is taking us on. We know where we're going, we know what the goal is, and we get to see a lot of emotion unpack on the way. Rut and Took also get some very fun added comedy moments in this movie. And so yeah, if you're a fan of the original Brother Bear, I would definitely recommend watching Watching this movie. It adds a lot more character development into Kenai and Koda, and while the two of them along with the moose are really the only characters that carry into this new movie, all of the new characters are actually pretty good, and I really think you will end up liking them just as much as I did. But with that, we're gonna move on up to number two on my list, which is Cinderella 3, A Twist in Time. Now, I had seen this movie before, and I had absolutely loved it. However, I love it even more now, having watched all of the other Disney animated sequels. Cinderella 3 A Twist in Time is an incredible movie. I love this one very much. The animation in this movie, although not the most detailed, is quite good. It holds up against the original. And the plot of this movie actually is a continuation of the original. At the very beginning of the movie, we pick up at Cinderella and Prince Charming's one-year anniversary. Anastasia follows them into the woods and realizes how Cinderella ended up with the prince by magic. Anastasia gets a hold of the fairy godmother's wand and brings it to her mother, and Lady Tremaine undoes the happily ever after that Cinderella gets at the end of the first movie. She brings them back to the moment when the Grand Duke is trying the shoe on her stepsisters and uses magic to make Anastasia the one that will end up marrying the prince. Throughout this movie, there is a lot of shenanigans that go down. However, ultimately Cinderella and the prince do end up back together, and at the end they're asked by Fairy Godmother, do you want me to restore you to your previous lives? And they end up acting confused, and she says, well, never mind. Now the best thing about this movie by far is the added character development. I hope she won't mind me saying this, but my mother is not the biggest fan of the character Cinderella from the original animated movie. And after I watched this movie with her, 
She said that she actually liked the character a lot more. Cinderella is a lot more proactive in this story and takes the reins, so to speak. Prince Charming himself, as well, is also very well rounded out. We really only get a few lines from him in the original movie, but in this one, he is actually given an entire personality. The king is also a lot less of a one-dimensional character, and Anastasia Tremaine is actually a lot more deep of a character as well, not just being a nuisance stepsister to Cinderella, but also genuinely wanting to find love in her own life. And don't get me started on Lady Tremaine. With a magic wand in her hand, she is significantly more of a threat to Cinderella and her friends. Really, the only moment in this movie I would say I don't like is the song that Jacques and Gus share. But besides that, I think this movie is extremely strong and very funny. And so would I recommend it? To any Cinderella fan out there, I definitely recommend Cinderella 3 A Twist in Time. The music is very pretty, the storyline is fantastic, the characters get so much more time on screen. Ugh, I love Cinderella 3 A Twist in Time and definitely recommend to anybody watching. But with that, friends, we have reached number one on my list of direct-to-DVD sequels. And funnily enough, this one actually isn't a sequel, it is a prequel. Yes, at number one is The Little Mermaid Ariel's Beginning. I love this movie. It is so perfect and so gorgeous, and such a great way to set up the original animated movie. The animation in this movie is just gorgeous, which I am so happy about considering so much of it takes place underwater. The storyline is just beautiful. The way that this movie is set up tells us about Ariel's mother and what happened to her. And when I tell you it is like a moment where your heart starts beating, it's, it's, it's emotional. Ariel's mother is also known for her beautiful singing voice. Her name is Queen Athena and she means quite a bit to our King Triton. Unfortunately, one day she does pass away at the hands of humans, and so King Triton bans the use of music in the entire kingdom of Atlantica. And so essentially what happens in the plot of this movie is that there is a secret underground club where different creatures gather together and they perform music. They try to keep music alive while it is technically illegal in the city. Eventually, Ariel finds her way there and also brings all of her sisters there as well. The club is found out by the king and his guards and unfortunately is destroyed. However, by the end of the movie, after the big climax, the king comes around and music is eventually restored to Atlantica. And it also sets up at the very end that Triton's daughters are now a musical group and that Sebastian is appointed the court composer. So it actually works out quite perfectly considering that that is exactly where we start off with the original animated movie. Now, with this movie, I will absolutely give it to production that the pacing of the storyline and the added comedy is absolutely amazing. I was sitting watching this movie absolutely belly laughing. Like, there are great moments of comedy in this movie. The music is very good and honestly quite catchy. Not all of it is composed by the Disney company. You will recognize other very well-known island music in this movie. The characters in this movie also very closely mirror their original appearance in the first animated movie, which makes me very happy because we get an actual viable Ariel in this movie. <laughs> Overall, I would say this movie definitely adds to the experience of the original animated movie, and I definitely recommend it to anybody who is a big Little Mermaid fan, especially with the added beautiful backstory of Ariel's mother. Oh, this movie is so good. I forgot how much I loved it, and now that I have rewatched it, I am definitely going to be having it in my generalized rotation of Disney movie watching. And with that, my friends, we have completed my list of direct-to-DVD Disney sequels. Thank you so much for joining me today. I had so much fun talking about all of these incredible sequels and some of these not-so-incredible sequels. <laughs> If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to like and subscribe down below so that way you never miss magic from me. And you can find me on my other social medias at Nikki Mara with two Y's and two R's. I also wanted to say the biggest thank you to each and every one of you who has subscribed because we just reached in this past week 1,000 subscribers. I am so grateful to have 1,000 friends here on the channel that are so invested in wanting to talk and learn more about Disney movies with me. And this has been such an incredible adventure so far, and I am so excited to see where this channel goes from here. I have so many more content ideas planned for the future, and I cannot wait to bring you along with me. And if you're not already, make sure to subscribe so that way you don't miss out on any of that future magic coming up.
And also, very big shout out to both of my friends, Victoria and Michaela, who joined me for certain specific movies in this sequel marathon. That is a thank you and an I'm sorry in case you didn't enjoy the movies that we watched together. <laughs> and with that, friends, thank you again so much. Stay magical, enjoy the rest of your week, and I'll see you all real soon.